So thank you very much and uh, thank you Felix uh, for the introduction. My name is Elisa Arguedo. I'm a professor at the New York University in uh, uh, New York. And the title of my seminar today is the Thermochemical Scanning Probe Lithography, TCSPL. So the um, basic idea of thermochemical uh, uh, SPL is similarly to thermal SPL, uh, the use of a, a hot probe, a hot tip. But uh, um, the uh, concept here is slightly different because what uh, thermochemical SPL is trying to do is actually to activate uh, by using heat a chemical reaction. And uh, as I will present uh, uh, later today, uh, this can give rise to grayscale patterning of uh, chemistry and functionality at the nanometer scale with simultaneously also the possibility to do a 3D uh, topography patterning. Um, the, uh, uh, the concept of uh, thermochemical nanolithography uh, was actually demonstrated in 2007 when uh, uh, I was uh, um, a professor at Georgia Tech. In fact, before moving to NYU, uh, I work at Georgia Tech. I was a faculty there for 13 years and uh, uh, a lot of my work on thermochemical SPL was actually developed when I was at Georgia Tech in collaboration with uh, Bill King, who at the time was also a, a professor at Georgia Tech and came from IBM where he did his postdoc. So, in fact, uh, um, Bill King worked with Binning and Vettiger at IBM in Zurich, moved to Georgia Tech, came with the technology of uh, hot tips and thermal probes, and talked to me about what can we do with this amazing technology. And that was when uh, um, uh, myself and my group, we started to think about using the thermal probes for activating chemical reaction and in this way to actually develop a method for nanopatterning surfaces. Later on, uh, IBM uh, worked more focusedly on the uh, thermal SPL in the sense of, uh, as you have seen in many other seminar, right, using the heat for the evaporation of uh, a resist PPA, which is excellent for the uh, topography patterning. And in 2013, uh, Swiss Lito, uh, the company, the startup company, came to life thanks to uh, Felix uh, and. Uh, Let's say the rest is history. <laughs> okay, so let's see a little bit uh, what you can do uh, with uh, uh, this concept of uh, thermochemical SPL. I must say that sometimes myself as well use TSPL just because now everything is becoming so broad that uh, uh, sometimes it doesn't really make sense to keep two names. So, um, TSPL and TCSPL may be actually used uh, interchangeable, but uh, um, let's try to stay focused for this seminar on the idea of the chemical reaction, of the thermally activated chemical reaction. So, um, so far uh, in my group, what we have demonstrated is the possibility to use uh, uh, a polymer and then activate the chemical reaction, expose some functional groups, and then use these functional groups to actually attach other molecules like proteins or enzyme, and also to create chemical gradients of these biomolecules. Um, next to that, we also have developed a few methods for using this thermochemical approach for uh, 3D patterning, so for topography patterning of the polymer. Um, we also use uh, uh, thermal and thermochemical uh, lithography for uh, um, uh, building, uh, uh, and I must say in, uh, for uh, uh, fabrication of uh, electrodes. Uh, in this case, I would say it's mainly thermal SPL, not thermochemical, so using the nanofreezer technology with PPA and uh, Shaori um, uh, um, uh, Wang uh, showed, uh, Zheng showed this uh, um, uh, last week, I believe. And uh, uh, you can also use the uh, thermal litog thermochemical lithography for magnetic patterning. And finally, you can use it 
uh, for uh, um, local crystallization. So you can use a salt gel of a ceramic material and the heat can be used for the local crystallization, for example, of ceramic nanowires like PZT, so ferroelectric and piezoelectric ceramic nanowires. Or going back here in the electronic materials, you can use it for reduction, for example. So you have, for example, graphene oxide and by using heat, you can reduce graphene oxide back to graphene. So again, is a thermochemical reaction locally activated by the hot probe. Okay, so today we're going to focus mainly on uh, um, chemical patterning uh, with uh, ad hoc polymers. So uh, similar to what you have seen for term uh, TSPL, um, you need a good polymer, a good resist that is thermally sensitive. Um, if you want to do a topograph, a chemical patterning, what you need is a polymer that not only is thermally sensitive, like it evaporates, like in PPA, but you want something slightly different. You want something that change uh, the chemistry due to the presence of heat. So this is an, a, 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 a polymetacrylate a copolymer and uh, uh, it has uh, some protective groups uh, here which are uh, which makes the polymer inert and relatively hydrophobic as well however these groups can be thermally deprotected by applying a temperature of about 125 degrees celsius so what you can do you can heat locally the polymer and you can deprotect uh, the polymer uh, from these groups uh, and you can expose carboxylic acid groups. So this is what you have here. So this, uh, uh, the white area here is where the uh, protective group has been ex uh, removed and it is where you have carboxylic acid groups. This is a, a friction image. Mm, why friction? Because friction tells you that some uh, chemistry is happening here. So um, next step was, okay, um, can we uh, actually um, think about uh, creating pat uh, patterns of carboxylic acid groups or even of amine groups, which are actually perfect uh, functional groups to attach biomolecules? Uh, and then deep in the solution of the biomolecule of interest, say proteins, and uh, use some uh, uh, bioconjugation scheme to attach the um, biomolecules here uh, selectively to the patterns of amine. Then wash some wash protocol and generate a pattern of proteins, for example. So that was the idea. This is the uh, second type of, of copolymer. So this is a copolymer where a, always a metacrylate copolymer where the um, functional groups now that are exposed after heating uh, are actually amine groups. Now uh, you follow the same protocols uh, and you can also think about different bioconjugation uh, steps. So for example, you can use uh, uh, deep in a solution with SPDP and transform your uh, uh, amine groups into tiles group uh, uh, through a second washing with DTT. Or you can bioconjugate the, um, the tiles group with some NI NHS biotin um, and then uh, have uh, uh, a pattern where you have biotin. Sorry, here, the red one is biotin. You have tiles here and you have amine here. You have, so you have three different functional groups. Uh, and then use these three different functional groups uh, in a solution with uh, proteins, for example, uh, which can be bioconjugated specifically in uh, each type of functional group. So on tiles or on amine groups or on uh, um, biotin. 
uh, and and this is these are the results. So these are different uh, different type of proteins that have been uh, um, uh, bioconjugated to the amine patterns, and uh, uh, the different colors shows the uh, the different uh, uh, proteins. And uh, this is instead is DNA, so showing that you can also pattern uh, DNA. Okay, next step. Next step is the idea of a chemical gradient. So can we um, create a chemical gradient? And the answer is yes. How do we do this? Well, the, um, the deprotection uh, of the thermally protective group is a chemical reaction, right? So it is uh, actually a, um, a first order chemical reaction that follows in a Arrhenius law. Uh, so we can write uh, the rate of the reaction with uh, a, a temp frequency, the temperature that we're using, and the activation energy of the chemical reaction. Then we can write uh, for, a, uh, um, um, for this uh, type of chemical reaction, we can write uh, the equation uh, of how the probability of the reaction change with time and it follows a first order chemical reaction equation, and then with, with, with K being the uh, rate of the reaction. So when you put the two equations together, you can see that by varying uh, the temperature T, or uh, by varying the variable of time, what is time? Time is uh, the dwelling time meaning the time that your tip stay in contact with the surface. So the longer you stay in contact, the higher the temperature, the more probable is that the chemical reaction happens. The faster you move, less time you stay in contact, less probable is the chemical reaction. So everything is inside here, so it can be very nicely analytically predicted and so you can really build a, a system of equa an analytic equation that, that predicts by knowing the time so th or the speed, so the dwell time or the speed, which is essentially the same thing, and the temperature of the probe predicts exactly what is the probability that uh, your reaction happens, which means uh, gives the probability of, uh, gives you the probabilistic amount of how many amine groups you have exposed. And so you can build complex pattern based on this. Uh, so you can e have an input image, in this case was a Mona Lisa image, and then uh, you can use your equation and know in each point how fast or how high the temperature should be in order to expose a certain amount of amine groups. And once you have that uh, pattern built, you can dip again your sample in a solution, bioconjugate the amine groups with, for example, um, uh, dye molecules or with uh, uh, fluorescent proteins and uh, then you go with your sample in an optical microscope, in a fluorescence optical microscope, and this is what you get. A fluorescence image of the Mona Lisa where um, the, uh, you see where the, the, the amount of amine is given by the, um, uh, by the fluorescence uh, uh, intensity. Uh, here are other images. This is uh, a Adam's uh, uh, rose uh, picture. And in this case, instead, this is a laminin. So this is a protein um, uh, used for guide neurons grow. Uh, uh, so uh, this is a gradient of laminin on the surface. The resolution is sub 100 nanometer resolution for this type of gradients. So these are the smallest gradients, chemical gradients uh, uh, built so far. Um, other steps here are, can we uh, now couple and have simultaneously control of chemical patterning and 3D topographical patterning like we have seen with PPA? So these are some, uh, some example. Uh, this is the same copolymer. 
uh, this is done with the nanofraser. So it shows uh, um, using this copolymer, not PPA. So it shows how you can pattern uh, the topography. Um, so the, um, the, uh, the mechanism here is, uh, is a little bit different. It's not the quick evaporation, but it's really more the deformation of the pattern due to the local uh, heat. So it's more a deformation driven uh, mechanism. There is also evaporation of uh, the protective group. So it's a combination of the two. And this is the chemical image. So it shows that where you have heated, so you see this is deeper, right? This, this the topography is indented. So you have heated more here. Well, there are also more amine groups here. So the fluorescence is higher. In this case, it's a very different type of uh, thermochemical reaction. This is a precursor polymer of PPV. PPV is a conjugated uh, semiconductor polymer, which uh, uh, once um, the, um, the precursor is transformed in PPV, uh, PPV, become, PPV is uh, also fluorescent. It's semiconductor and fluorescent. So what it shows here is that the image is uh, uh, showing some fluorescence, but it shows also a 3D patterning because when the precursor is transforming PPV, there is also a, um, a, a shrinking uh, uh, process. So you can also uh, change the topography by, um, uh, by looking at the, um, sorry, not a shrinking, a, a, a swelling process. Okay, next step. Okay, what is the ultimate resolution, chemical resolution that we can achieve with this method? And can we really combine this with an extreme high uh, uh, topographical resolution? Why we want this? So uh, this was uh, and still is the uh, vision for why we started to go into this direction. So we wanted uh, to add a, a, a another dimension in our patterning, right? So we are patterning the chemistry, one. We are patterning the topography in three dimension, X, Y, and Z. So we have four dimension of patterning, of control. Now we are adding a fifth dimension, which is time. Can we create patterns that change with time? So they, they form and they dissolve. So dynamic nanopatterning or transient nanopatterning. How do we do this? Well, we can combine the, um, uh, we can combine the, uh, um, the chemical uh, patterning with biocatalytic self-assembly. And uh, uh, this self-assembly, I just saw the time, 39 minutes. Uh, Felix, I'm okay. I, can I keep going? <laughs> sure, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good, good. good. <laughs> right, so 39 minutes. So I saw. Okay, so I, I will try to go a little bit faster. So well, you, you can... You, you just talk for, for maybe 20 minutes maximum. Ah, oh, good. So I don't know why I have 40 minutes here. Good. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, the, the, uh, so what is biocatalytic self-assembly? So essentially this is a reaction uh, that is triggered by enzyme. And uh, uh, once uh, a, a peptide solution, certain peptides are uh, um, embedded in a solution in presence of particular enzymes, what you have is a self-assembly of the peptides to form this very interesting fiber structure. And not only these fibers can form, but you can also use a biofuel to stop the reaction and then to reactivate the reaction. So with an external chemical trigger. So the idea here is to pattern enzyme on a surface with TCSPL where Ideally, we can have one enzyme per, uh, per spot and then bring in a solution uh, with these peptides, the biofuel, and start the growth of the, the fibers uh, in each spot. 
and uh, uh, if we can also pattern different uh, different enzyme we will have also different types of fibers so what it shows here it shows uh, that uh, depending on the biofuel we can activate the fibers green and blue or we can activate the fiber orange green and blue or only the fiber orange so we can control in time what nanostructures form. So this is the, uh, the general idea. Uh, our part, uh, so this was a collaboration with uh, Professor Uline at CUNY, and uh, our part, of course, is can we create patterns with single enzyme on the surface? So um, this work was, was uh, uh, performed in my lab uh, uh, with my student, Xin Liu, uh, uh, Liu uh, Shan Liu, um, and uh, we call it Shen, uh, with uh, uh, this type of scheme. So we start again with the pristine polymer that I showed you before. So this is a metacrylate copolymer. Uh, uh, which expose amine groups, okay? Then, uh, as I say before, you can either expose amine groups at a certain temperature, then uh, dip in an enzyme solution, or you can also, we realized, if heating at much higher temperature, you can uh, go through a different chemical path and passivate the polymer. So, depending on the temperature, you can uh, change the amount of amine exposed, you can decide to passivate the polymer or by controlling, and this is by controlling the temperature, okay? Like I say before, so the gradient, right? The temperature uh, can, can control the density of how many amine groups we can expose. Um, however, by controlling the load, so how much we, uh, we, we, what pressure we apply between the tip and the surface, we can also control the depth of the, um, uh, of the pocket where the enzyme we're going to stick. So the idea here is to be able to control the density of the enzyme and the 3D topography of the in enzyme. Then uh, the bioconjugation that is used here is, is an electrostatic bioconjugation. So what we are going to do is we are going to attach the enzyme by using a, a sulfonated group which are negatively uh, charged. So these sulfonated groups are, uh, um, are uh, uh, conjugated to the enzyme and they are negatively attached, uh, uh, ne sorry, negatively charged and uh, so they are strongly uh, attracted by the NH3 plus group on the surface. Uh, remember, all this uh, is happening in water. Um, uh, this reaction is happening in water and uh, uh, at room temperature. So first you create the amine and then the reaction of this uh, uh, electrostatic attachment happens in water. So it's a very strong, actually, um, it's a very robust, even if it's electrostatic, it's very robust. Um, this is a slide showing the uh, surface passivation scheme. So here what you have is uh, the pristine polymer. And as you can see here, unfortunately, the pristine polymer, um, even if it is pristine, when you, uh, you dip in the solution with the enzyme, uh, uh, some of the enzyme will still attach to the polymer. Uh, so you are not able to, remember this enzyme uh, are bringing a, a very strong uh, negative charge. So uh, somehow the, uh, the polymer is still attracting this enzyme. So the, um, the, 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 the non-specific binding is quite elevated. However, uh, if we heat at very high temperature this area, we can actually expose, as you can see here, some uh, COOH groups uh, which are negatively charged. And so these uh, uh, carboxylic acid groups are actually um, uh, repulsing 
the, posit the, the negative uh, uh, enzyme uh, groups. Uh, and so they don't want to stick to the passivated area. So you see how dark is now the passivated area. On the other hand, the inner square is where we have the amine groups. So the positive NH3 groups uh, are instead attracting and uh, uh, quite strongly keeping uh, attracted uh, the uh, negatively charged enzyme groups. So this is the, the scheme and this is FTIR to confirm uh, the presence of the different functional group that we are exposing. Okay, um, this slide uh, shows instead how we can control the enzyme density with the temperature, so the uh, percentage of amine groups and the pocket depth, meaning the 3D, right? How, it, how, in, um, uh, how deep is the indent that we are making? Yeah? So we can calibrate, so we can change temperature and load, this is showing the density of the amine groups. Uh, this is the fluorescence showing how it changed with the temperature. This uh, is a, um, instead there is a calibration where we change temperature and load at the same time. So you have the different uh, curve here are uh, indentation versus load for different temperature. And this is the uh, uh, the, uh, the two main equations that we are using. So we are using a modified Earth model, uh, modified because they, we, we assume that the young modulus of the polymer becomes lower and lower with increasing temperature. So we can quite well control uh, the, uh, the, the pocket depth by increasing the temperature because the softer is the polymer, right? The more for the same pressure, we can make a bigger indent. This is what this equation is telling us. And with the load, so the higher the pressure, the bigger the indent. So this equation is essentially giving us the fitting for the experimental curves. And uh, together with this equation, which is similar to what we have before, but now we have also to keep in mind that there is a passivation going on. So the activation of negatively and positively charged molecules. And that's why here you have the, the, the fluorescence have a maximum. So in the beginning, you expose only the, the positive charges. So the enzyme won't attach. But then high temperature, you start to expose also the negative charges, which repels the enzyme. So you have a maximum and then a decreasing. So by playing with this temperature that control the density and the temperature and load here that control the depth, you can precisely know how much enzyme you have and how deep your pocket it is. So you have a, a extreme good control of the, um, of the two, uh, uh, parameters, depth and density. Okay, so these are uh, other images showing that, you know, the, you can do AFM to confirm the fact that first you put the amine, so you see there is this indentation, so formation of the pocket, so the indent, or let's say this is, this is the, the pocket, right? This is what we are doing. We are creating a pocket and we put we, we then put the enzyme on it so this is with enzyme so after dipping in the solution with the enzyme and you see that the indentation disappear because the whole pocket now is filled with the enzyme and you can see this at different scale this is a hundred nanometer pocket filled with enzyme and this is the corresponding fluorescence demonstrated the presence also of the enzyme. Then we pushed the uh, resolution and what you can see here is that we are able actually to make pockets where uh, uh, the size of the pocket is 8 nanometer, the size of the, a single enzyme is about eight, uh, 6 nanometer, so uh, these are single enzyme pockets. And these are nanowires where each wire actually has only 
one enzyme in it uh, in terms of width. So our single enzyme nanowires. And uh, uh, this is the demonstration by fluorescence that indeed these uh, uh, wires have been filled with uh, uh, enzyme. And you can see also in AFM here. Uh, then uh, the, the last, uh, the last uh, goal was, can we create single enzyme patterning over large scale? So what you see here is the logo of NYU Tandon. So Tandon is the engineering school of NYU where I work. So every letter here, everything that you see here is made of single enzyme line, lines. So the idea here is we built this N, again, you see the nano fraser image. So this N, you see, uh, zoom in here, is made of lines and each line is about eight, 10 nanometer width in width. Then you deepen the solution with the enzyme. The enzyme stick inside each uh, single enzyme line and this, then you go in a fluorescence microscope and you demonstrate that indeed your enzyme are filling uh, uh, your uh, uh, single uh, uh, enzyme lines. And the scale is pretty large. So this is 100 micrometer. Uh, so um, yeah, this, we were quite happy about this uh, result of large scale with single enzyme resolution. Okay, so what next? So right now we are working with uh, uh, pro, uh, with Dr. Uh, Giuseppe De Pep um, uh, at the New York Stem Cell Foundation on uh, uh, biomedical application. What type of biomedical application? Well, right now we are uh, focusing on uh, tissue engineering. So um, can we actually design uh, tissue microenvironment uh, with the morphological and physiological features uh, resembling those in vivo. Meaning, can we do a precise chemical and topographical replica of uh, the uh, tissue microenvironment? So, uh, there are a lot of attempts uh, around uh, in literature, right, where uh, the tissue has been uh, um, um, uh, where the, um, the interaction between cells uh, and uh, uh, micro pattern or nano pattern have been studied and some tissue engineering study, a lot of actually of tissue engineering studies have been done, but mainly either uh, uh, the uh, uh, scientists used uh, self-assembly, so quite a disorder type of uh, uh, microenvironment uh, fabrication or uh, uh, they use uh, conventional fabrication methods like optical lithography or e-beam lithography where um, very, um, how to say, uh, very, um, very uh, ordered and simple structure can be fabricated like pillars. So the typical example is an array of pillars. But you can see how uh, a tissue, a human tissue is very different from an array of pillars, right? So uh, the capability of TCSPL and, SP and TSPL would allow us to reproduce the complexity of the human tissue in 3D and maybe even the chemistry. So this is the idea. Uh, this is a SEM image of uh, uh, the, bone, uh, uh, the bone tissue at the nanoscale is showing this uh, uh, microfibrils and the size of these uh, uh, microfibrils uh, is really accessible by uh, TCSPL. So uh, you can see that it's around 200 nanometer, the, 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 the larger um, the distance, so the, the, the diameter of the fibrils is 200 nanometer. And then you have all these uh, tiny nanoscale features that have size between uh, uh, 60 nanometer and the height here is just uh, uh, 20 nanometer. So these are uh, all scales that we can uh, actually assess uh, with uh, uh, TCSPL. So this is uh, uh, a preliminary data where uh, uh, we use the nanofraser 
uh, to replicate um, to replicate the um, the bone tissue image. So this is uh, an in vitro uh, bone tissue image, and uh, this is uh, the perfect exact replica of it with uh, uh, the nano fraser. Uh, the, um, so this work uh, has been uh, submitted for publication and uh, uh, as I said, this is a collaboration between my group and uh, uh, the PEPO group at the New York Stem Cell Foundation uh, and uh, Alessandra Zanut, who is a postdoc uh, in my group uh, and uh, Shen Liu, uh, who is a PhD in my group. So um, uh, one important thing to, to uh, 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 since the work is only submitted, I cannot give you too many uh, uh, details. <laughs> uh, don't want to, otherwise my collaborators are going to kill me. <laughs> uh, so I cannot give you too many um, information. You will have to wait until the paper is published. However, the, um, the main, uh, the key thing here is that the polymer that we use is again the metacrylate copolymer, which means we not only can control the topography but also the chemistry. So we will really have access right to this complex physiology and topography and morphology of the human tissue. Okay, to conclude, um, I switch gear completely and move towards electronic devices. So um, uh, Ray Cheng uh, already talked about um, contacts on molybdenum disulfide fabricate for field effect transistor fabricated by uh, thermal lithography and how these contacts have superior uh, um, performances compared to uh, conventional methods like e-beam lithography. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into details of this, uh, just for the ones of you who were not present at Ray uh, seminar. Let me tell you uh, the, the, the idea is that you use a, a two polymer stack uh, on top of a, a monolayer of molybdenum disulfide deposited on silicon oxide, uh, PMGI and PPA. So uh, you use TSPL to evaporate locally PPA. Then you use some chemical etching for the undercut here and then metal deposition and finally lift off. With that, you can uh, uh, pattern complex uh, uh, um, uh, design of electrodes on molybdenum disulfide. You can create also a top gated uh, field effect transistor uh, where the top gate, you can use the nano fraser beautifully to really image where the two electrode source and drain are so that you can visually see where your uh, top gate, uh, in, in, you see, in the middle can actually be uh, fabricated. So you don't need at all markers. Uh, so that's a big advantage compared to e-beam lithography. Other advantage from EBL is the cleanliness of the surface, as you can see here. Okay, so, uh, based on this, we went further and we said, okay, now not only we can fabricate devices, can we also dope using the idea of thermochemical reaction? And this is what we have done. We have built a, a gas flow uh, chamber. So um, this work was done uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Ray Sheng in my group uh, and uh, uh, Annalisa uh, Calo, who was also a postdoc in my group. Uh, she's now in Barcelona. And uh, um, as you can see here, there is a, a gas flow chamber where you can uh, uh, not only heat, but you can expose uh, your surface to certain gases. So there is a chemical reaction between the heat and the gases present in the chamber. And so depending on the gases that you choose, you can achieve end, either N-doping or P-doping. So for P-doping, for example, you use a, uh, a, a mixture of HCl and water, and for N-doping, you heat in nitrogen. So you can control N and P-doping, so you can have a bipolar doping, and you can then fabricate a PN junction. 
this is what we have done. Uh, the, again, the electrodes have been fully, uh, completely, uh, are fully deposited with TSPL. So the whole device from doping to electrode fabrication has been completely fabricated with thermal and thermochemical lithography. And this is the rectification ratio, 10 to the power 4 of the diode, which is really an extremely uh, good uh, result uh, comparable with uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, PN junction in uh, uh, molybdenum disulfide. With that, I finish my seminar and I would like to thank people in my group. I already mentioned Shaori Zheng, uh, Shang Yu Liu, uh, Annalisa Kalo, Edoardo Albizetti, Alessandra Zanut, and uh, um, who are the, the, the main people working on TC and TSPL. And uh, actually, um, also they were working on TCSPL, but these are people who uh, left already my group. And uh, um, Francesco uh, is still in my group, and uh, uh, Li Wen Xie and Xin Liu Zhu are also still in my group, but worked a little bit less on, on this project. And then my collaborated collaborators uh, at NYU, Shargerdi Davud for the um, uh, electronic measurements, uh, Uline at CUNY, Marcus Back, who actually developed the metacrylate copolymer uh, for all the um, experiments that you have seen, Bill King uh, uh, for our initial collaboration and also Jennifer Curtis for our initial collaborator collaboration and then all the team at uh, uh, Swiss Lito, which is now, I'm <laughs> sorry, uh, Heidelberg Instruments who have been fantastic and always, uh, um, always willing to help uh, and also actually uh, a great uh, friendship developed and the funding agency, of course. So thank you very much. <laughs>